Hello, and welcome back to another edition of Potluck, your everything and anything talk and entertainment TV show. My name is Laura Hartman, and I am your host. Today we have an amazing returning guest joining our show who is, she is a disabled veteran, a mother of two amazing boys, actually one is a young man who's in the Air Force. She's married to a veteran Marine, and she's a mentor to countless veteran women. Um, she is the recipient of some amazing and unbelievable prestigious awards for her nonprofit organizations, FinalSaluteInc.org and Miss Veteran America. And to top it all off, with all her time that she, her unlimited time, I should say, she has managed to write a book about her past or a past that nobody should experience. And she's managed to talk about it and how she's overcome it. And her book we're going to be talking about today is called The Princess and the Pedophile. So please welcome back to the show, Jazz Booth. So welcome back. Oh, hi, Laurie. Thank you again for, for having me back. It's always an honor to be here to talk to you and be on Potluck TV. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you definitely are an inspiration to so many women out there, especially you know, veteran women and non-veteran women and people alike. Um, how did you find the time to write a book with all the things that you do and to open up about your past? Um, <clears throat> I will tell you, it's, it's been difficult. Um, it wasn't finding the time that was an issue. It was finding the courage. Okay. It has taken me 20 years to get up enough courage to be able to to talk about this very, very difficult time in my life, but I felt that I needed to. You know, through, through my work, I have been able to talk to a lot of women, veteran women in particular, who are going through difficult situations. And I have always, you know, taken a very, you know, practical and tough, tough love approach with them with letting them know, hey, you have to, you have to face with your issues um, to be willing to, to move on. You have to deal with them head on in order to move past it. Mm -hmm. And here I've been having this issue for 20 years who has been eating at my core that I hadn't been able to deal with. And I'm, I'm like, you know, Jazz, you kind of need to follow your own advice on this. Right. And, um, you know, people look at the things that they see me in the media and they're like, oh, Jazz is so strong. She's done all these amazing things. And I was feeling a little bit, you know, hypocritical because I had this one issue that I hadn't been able to deal with and get past. And I said, you know what, you've, you've helped so many people, you've in, inspired so many people, but now you need to work on this one issue um, on yourself that you haven't been able to deal with. And so um, I needed to write the book, not only for myself, but I know there are so many other women who have unfortunately dealt with dealt with molestation at a very young age that hadn't been able to find that closure and haven't been able to find a healing mechanism. And so through writing, I've been able to do both. Okay, great, great. So how did you get started or what were, you know, some of the outlets that you, you know, were there people that helped you, like maybe your husband's, you know, kind of rooting you on to, to do this? And what were the first steps to get started? And it, it looks like you did self-publishing. Yeah, I, I yeah. kind of, you know, wrote this book, wrote, wrote the book in secrecy. Okay. So I kind of let my husband know that I was writing what I was writing about, but I didn't really get into the details of it. Oh, wow. You know, because I wasn't writing for him. I wasn't writing for anybody else. I was writing for myself. Um, and so I did just start to write. I didn't know what direction the book was going, but I didn't. It's not written from a trauma perspective sure. because reliving other people's trauma doesn't help them with theirs. So I wrote it from an, an educational standpoint. I wrote it from the, you know, how this particular event affected other life events mm -hmm. um, with me, how it affected me as a mother, you know, how it affected me as a wife and how it affected me as a woman. So I wrote from the lessons perspective and I wanted people to see how it affected me, but also how I was able to, to overcome it sure. and be able to help other women that are facing other circumstances. And so I just, I just wrote, you know, I didn't have a particular order. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't start with, you know, I was born and raised and, you know, right, it, it's right. not chronological. It kind of it starts from the incident, then it goes into different subcategories of my life. But I realized how angry I was when I first wrote it 
my first generation was very attacking. Um, it was very angry, but it let me know that, you know, wow, I really didn't know how, how bad much, right? it affected me and how angry I was still um, over the events. But as I, once I got it out, I was able to go back and, and help it. And I actually did have a, um, a ghost writer, thank you, Lenny, um, <laughs> for helping me to get it out. Because sometimes you need people to kind of, you know, help you along the way. And it was very um, therapeutic mm -hmm. for me to write it. But I didn't write, want it to be an angry piece. I didn't want it to be an attacking piece. So I did have someone helping me, you know, with that. But I was glad that I got it out because I was able to get that anger and aggression out and mm -hmm. be able to focus on the more positive aspects, you know, of my life and the lessons learned sure. through those events. Sure. So it was very, very ther therapeutic for you. It was. Yeah. You know, we, we find closure in different ways, and sometimes people tell you, you know, once you forgive, you will have closure, and that didn't work for me. Sure. Um, because forgiveness doesn't erase the events that happened to you. It kind of like, okay, we've had the conversation, you've acknowledged your responsibility in it, and we're able to move past it. And that isn't always the, you know, the, the antidote for, for everything. Right. You know, so <clears throat> for me, um, but ironically, I wasn't able to have those conversations, you know, with my mother. Um, I wasn't able to get conversation. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to get closure in the way of in the way of conversation, and so I had to again find another another medium, which I was to, able to get, you know, through writing. Okay, now just to give people an idea of what the book is about, can you give like a brief synopsis? Because we kind of just jumped into this and, you know, of course, uh, people know what, you know, a pedophile is, but right. why don't we just kind of introduce it? Don't tell too much because this is a great book. <laughs> um, I've read this book and I couldn't put it down because it, it's so, you know, full of heart and it's really, really touching. All right. Well, the, the book is about personally, again, um, you know, my experience, my, uh, my stepfather, you know, was a pedophile. Um, and so, you know, he not only you know, molested me, he also molested, you know, my oldest sister. And so the, the book is about my experience, but again, how that ev one event shaped every other, you know, aspect um, of my life. And I also want people to know that because this experience happened to you, you do not have to, you know, live in a constant state of perpetual, you know, victim mentality. But society teaches us that and it, society kind of paints that excuse for us. If you molested and you turned out to be a drug addict or you turned out to be X, Y, and Z, the excuse or the the um, the reason is because you experience this thing. So it's it's acceptable if you don't turn out the best person that you that you can be. And I'm like, you know, it's not acceptable because bad things happen through people all the time. Mm -hmm. But it's how you deal with that situation. As a kid, you can't you know, do anything about someone who's molesting you because you're a child. But however, you have your parents and other people that are supposed to protect you. And unfortunately, this came at the, my molestation came at the hands of someone who was my, you know, parental figure. But I didn't want that event to, to shape me as an adult. And I didn't want to use that event as an excuse, you know, not to succeed or not to excel as a person. You know, as a child, you don't have most a lot of control over your life because you are a child and you are reliant on your parents to raise and rear you. But I had made a decision as a child on what kind of adult I was going to be. I made a decision as a child on what kind of mother and what kind of wife and what kind of woman I was going to be. And it was because of this single event. Wow. So you kind of had to mature that early, you know, to you had a realization. Right. You know, I didn't I didn't have a great idea of what right looked like, okay. but I had yeah. an idea of what wrong looked like. Okay. And, you know, and so I knew that I wasn't going to let anyone molest my children or hurt my children. I knew that I wasn't going to be involved with the man who was going to abuse me. And I knew that I was going to be a kind of woman who, who fought for others and mm -hmm. wasn't going to accept certain things in my life. Sure, sure. Now, in your book, um, you, you did talk about, you know, what happened with your father and then going into your first relationship into your My first stepfather. Your stepfather, <laughs> sorry. Yes. Your stepfather and then getting married to your first husband. Um, sometimes there's always, there's a pattern. Like if you grow up where there's abuse, you tend to attract that. So do you think that was the case for your first husband? Well, I think with, with my first husband, um, he's not my, my, um, 
my oldest son's father, but he came, I had my oldest son at a very young age, mm -hmm. and um, he, his family, I met him right when I started college, so his mm -hmm. family actually raised my child, you know, for the first, first four years of college, so I felt indebted to him. Okay. And so when he started to become, you know, mentally, emotionally, and physically abusive, I've kind of accepted it as, you know what, you did this other one thing for me, my son was safe, it allowed me to go to college and get education, so I kind of okayed it. Mm -hmm. But with that okay, I started to realize and see the comparison of how my stepfather was those types of abusive to my mother, and I'm like, you know what, this is not okay and it's not acceptable. Right. I don't care what you did for me, that doesn't give you a right to do these things to me. And so once I continued to see, you know, a lot of familiar things in him that I saw my stepfather, I had to get out of the relationship because it wasn't good for me and it definitely wasn't good for my son. Right. But but I think again, we as women, you know, we look at situations um, of where men are abusive to us, that, but they might be doing these other things that we need in our lives, but it doesn't make it okay and you really don't need it. And you know, again, your children see everything. So mm -hmm. I definitely didn't want my son seeing the things that I saw, you know, going on with my mother and my father. And so it was a, a time that I needed to end that relationship. Sure. Now, your son, your oldest son, um, he under has he read your book? He hasn't the book. He, the, he read the chapter about himself. Okay. <laughs> um, but he hasn't read it. I'm pretty sure that he will. But you know, he's out. He's serving his country sure. doing doing so yeah. many things. But you know, um, Brandon lived a lot of these things right, with right. me. Yeah. You know, we were very close. Um, I was a single mother when I raised him. You know, during the time, so we were very close to a lot of these things. You know, he already knows about, mm -hmm. and I've talked to him about. So even if he didn't read it, he's aware. Okay. So. How how does he feel about you know this topic, and I'm sure he's been extra extra protective of you over these years. You know, it's um definitely something that he's just you know tells me, mom, you've been through so many things, and yet you still you know raised me and kept mm -hmm. me away from these types of things. So he just you know he looks at me as his not only as his mom but as his has his hero uh -huh. and and a person who you know when he thinks about certain situations he's like yeah it's bad but you know if you got through this and I can get through this it's nothing of of what you went through. So he looks he looks at me you know as his inspiration and as someone that he can revert back to when he's going through difficult times. Sure. Hey, if she got through all of that then I can get through it too. Oh, right, right. Now um as far as because you have very you have a ton of veteran women friends um, have any come up to you and said hey you know I've read your book and this is exactly what happened to me or I had a similar situation yes. and I'm still struggling you know or, or, even with I know what you in the in the back of the book and at the end of the book you have some really good words of wisdom of what responses that you have for your mother and your sister and your family um, and I don't want to give anything away, but um, how do you, even if they've read that part, how do you help them? Or well, it, it was very interesting and very shocking and surprising that, you know, so many of my friends did come forward and say, you know, this really helped me because I went through this. Right. And, you know, in, in a lot of our families, when it does happen at the hands of a relative, you know, it's something that's kind of not really talked about, not something that really addresses, just kind of accepted as something that happened, and, but now let's keep our family together and move forward. Sure. And so it's just was shocking, so many of the similarities and so many women who have went through this. You know, I was also reached out to by complete strangers, you know, that shared their stories with me and said, you know, thank you for sharing your story. Now I feel like I'm able to share mine because sometimes you think, you know, it's just me. It's sure. just something that I went through. But through my journey, I've met so many people who I went through so many similar things, and I'm, and it's just appalling that that we have to experience that, especially from someone that you love and you know and that you trust. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I also want people to know that this is not a bash book. You know, it's not oh, a sure. it, it's not a book. You know, attacking my stepfather is not a book attacking my mother because it doesn't help anyone who's trying to get through their situations because we all have, still have that anger, you know, inside of us. Mm -hmm. But I did, you know, want people to know that you, even though it's not a bash book, you still have to hold those people accountable. Sure. You still have to let them know this is how this affected me and that it was wrong. It doesn't mean that I do not love my mother. I love my mother, you know, with all, with all my heart. But, you know, she has some responsibility in the issue, even though she didn't personally do anything 
you know, to me, sure. I still feel as a parent, you need to protect your children, you know, from, from exposing them and allowing people to do these things, you know, to them. But, you know, it, it's been 20 years. Right. And so, you know, like you said, you talked about the message that I have from my mother and my stepfather in the back of the book. And I wanted to let them know that um, I see things differently at 37, although I don't look 37. No, you honestly. don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, seen, I see things differently at 37 than I did at 17. Sure. So at 17, I couldn't understand that my mother was also a, a battered woman and an abused wife. You know, so it may have not been, you know, her ability to be able to protect us in the way that I felt that she needed to. Does it make it right? No, but it gives me gives me a different level, you know, of understanding. Sure. You know, I also understand that, you know, I was I'm still not as close to my sisters, but maybe if I had been closer to them, you know, maybe we would have turned out different or maybe we had a, a, a different relationship. But all I wanted to do was just break contact you know, from that situation and from the people that mm -hmm. I felt, you know, not only were responsible, but I was the youngest daughter. You know, I'm the third girl, so I felt like, you know, my sister should have done something right, too. Right. But not understanding now at 37 that, man, they were going through their own experiences too. Right. You know, so I wanted people to also, you know, understand that, you know, sometimes people are not in the best situation to help you because they're going through their same situation as well. Right, and they can't help themselves. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now, for um, I, I mentioned earlier off camera about an experience that I had as a child, and um, where I had two neighbor boys that were the same age as me that were picking on me um, and trying to sexually abuse me. And um, <clears throat> after a couple of times, I you know finally reached out to my brother, who my brother went after them and, you know, beat them up or did whatever and it never happened again. Good, good brother. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very good brother. So, um, but I, years later I found out that one of the boys, his father sexually abused him. Mm -hmm. So that's where, like, he learned that. Um, back then I didn't know any better. Right. You know, I mean, I didn't even know what sex was back then, you know, um, at that age. I think I was like six or seven. So. Um, if somebody, you know, how, I don't know how to explain this, but like to get younger kids to be able to identify and then to, are there any outreaches? Well, you know, I think the bigger issue is, you know, we are always warning our children about strangers. Yes. You know, if your teacher does something to you, tell me, you know, if you're whoever, if you're a friend's parents or anybody else does things to you, tell me. Mm -hmm. But are we telling our children it's a, it's wrong for daddy to touch you? Are we telling our children it's wrong for your sisters and brothers to touch you? Are we telling our children that it's wrong for me to touch you? Right. And I think that's the bigger issue is we're warning kids about all of the outside dangers, but not really talking to them about dangers that can come from inside of your home. You know, I knew my biological father, um, but he was he was married to his wife. And, you know, my mother had her own, mm -hmm. you know, family and husband. Sure. But, you know, um, I didn't initially see what my stepfather was doing as wrong. I took it as an act of love. And I think that's probably the bigger conversation that we're not having is that it's wrong if anybody touches you, whether they're blood, whether they're strangers. And I think that's why a lot of us, you know, we're not accepting of the molestation, but we see it not as molestation, but as something that me and my dad did that was special or something that me and my uncle or whoever did, right. you know, that is special. So I think we as parents, um, caregivers or whoever need to let our children know that any act of molestation from anybody is wrong, regardless of who they are, whether they're strange or related to you. And I think that's the bigger conversation that we need to be having with our children. Right. And I think, um, one thing that may prevent that is because, you know, I mean, sex is a big topic and younger and younger kids are seeing it these days, but it's not really, you know, it's still like taboo a lot. So that may be harder for people to talk about. But, you know, I wonder if there's any like outreach programs to, you know, for people to reach out to. No, I'm not, um, you know, that's not, that's not my area of expertise, but I sure. do see, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of, um, things out in the community, you know, reference, um, you know, parents reaching out to their kids and talking to their kids. You also see a lot of schools that are now 
talking a lot of more about sex. They're talking a, about a lot of talk topics, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, children having gay classmates, children have transgender classmates. Um, but I think that a lot of those conversations need to happen in the house first. Right, right, um, yes. You know, don't, I don't think you should rely on, you know, on an institution. School, yeah you know, to talk to your children about things that you need to be talking to them about a parent. Sure. You know, so for me going through these circumstances, you know, I talk to my children very early on. Don't let anybody touches you, you know, touch you. If daddy touches you, it's wrong. If mommy touches you, you, you tell on mommy if mommy does something and you tell on daddy too. Right. So I think that you need to instill that to them early on as a child. So if something happens to them, you know, they'll know that nobody needs to be touching me you know, in, in any any type of ways. And, and another thing that I, I also talked to you off camera about is how, you know, I also feel society forces young mothers into these relationships of mm -hmm. social acceptance. You know, as a single mother, I was seen as a certain way. You know, s single mothers get such a bad deal, such a bad rep. You know, you're, you're seen as, you know, unfit if you're a single mother or you're seen as unfit if you have children from, you know, one or two or multiple men. Right. And so women are, you know, getting into these relationships with these men that, well, you know, he's accepting of my kids, so I need to be with him. So society will see us, won't see me as a single mother, but now society will see me and accept me as a family. Right. And this is part of that problem. My mother was a, a young mother with three girls. And here this man comes along, you know, that loves her and wants to marry her and help her take care of her children, you know, mm -hmm. but wasn't really aware that she was marrying a predator. Right. You know, we right now are unfortunately, we as women and as single mothers are marketing ourselves as package deals. If you marry me, you're marrying my children. No, they're not. You know, that man is for you. That man is not for your kids. But you have to get to know that man before bringing him around your kids. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody is not meant to meet your kids and not every man is meant to be daddy. Right. You know, but you first have to see how that man treats you as a woman. If he's abusive to you, he's not a good role model for your kids. He's mm -hmm. not husband and he's definitely not daddy material. So you need to first learn everything you can about that man. You know, does he have kids? If he's an older, my stepfather didn't have any children. Why doesn't he have any children? Right. You know, so you have to thoroughly do your research and have to be, you know, very careful about who you bring around your children as a young mother and stop marketing yourself as a package deal. You are not, you're an individual. You're marrying that man for you. You're not marrying that man for your kids. Right, right. Now, what if somebody, I have a friend who, um, she dated a guy for several years and she thought she knew him, but as soon as she got married to him, he turned and became abusive. What do you do in that instance? And I will say, of, you know, of course you don't. <clears throat> um, there's, and you know, sometimes predators, they are experts. Mm -hmm. They are very good at concealing who they are. Right. But even if you've spent so much time with this person and now you're married and now their true colors are coming out and now you're seeing these things, you need to break contact with them, you know, regardless of how much time you, you spent you, you spent with them, especially if there are children involved. Sure. Because it will spill over. Oh yeah. You know, I've never met a woman to just say, you know, he was abusive to me but he treated my kids great. Especially that they're, they're not, you know, his kids. Right, you know, right. an, an abuser is an abuser, a molester is a molester, and eventually it will rear his ugly head. And I know that, you know, people are very spiritual and people are very religious. They don't believe in divorce. And they don't believe in X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. But, you know, God will forgive you. Sure. You know, um, but don't sacrifice yourself, you know, because you don't want to get the divorce. You don't want to be looked at in a certain way. You don't want people to judge you. You know, what's more important is the safety of you and the safety of your children and your family. Right. So it's a definitely a tough decision to make. But, you know, you might, you know, they're going to say, I'm never going to hit you again. I'm never going to do this again. And some people don't get the opportunity to give someone a second chance because sometimes they will kill you. Right. You know, so you don't want to, you know, keep yourself and your children in an abusive or in a dangerous environment. Sure. Okay. So, um, so what's next for you? <laughs> um, you know, um, people actually with the book, you know, each chapter has a, a corresponding jazzism that they have. Yeah, it's like yeah. my little life quips, like, you know, one really short, like that. <laughs> <laughs> one little short sentence. So, but yeah. they're, they're very educational. Some are funny and, and some are deep. And so people have asked me to put together a book of jazzisms. Um, so maybe that's my, 
my next project. Maybe I'll do some jazz or some sticky notes so, okay. you know, people can, you know, use them for everyday life. Um, but also, I've told you with with writing this book, I've also learned a lot. So while, while writing, I was learning more lessons. And so I might um, do in a, a new edition each year with adding an additional chapter, right. you know, to this current book. Um, I don't see myself as a self-help person. People like writing, write a self-help book. Right. Like I'm not a self-help kind of, <laughs> you know, person. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, people are able to find inspiration in things, um, you know, from you. So I'll continue to take, again, this life lesson and how it's, how it's affected me. You know, it's still affecting me. I'm still learning from myself. I'm still healing from it. But I will have to, to tell people that you have to find, again, your way of healing and your your media mechanism for moving past it and just and just focus on that. Okay, great. Well, we're um, apparently running out of time, so where can people pick up The Princess and the Pedophile? Yes, um, if you're a ebook kind of person, uh -huh. you can get it on Amazon okay. um, and download it, um, you know, to your smart device. Or if you would like a hard copy, you can get it on Create Space. Okay. And if you're local to the area, on October 10th, I am doing a book signing at Prosperous Books in Manassas okay. um, from 3 to 5 p.m., I believe. You can come, purchase a hard copy, and I will personally autograph okay. it for you. Okay, very good. And do you have a website for the book? or um, You can get it e either on cr cr Amazon or CreateSpace. I'm okay. just you know using, using those mechanisms right now. Got it, okay, great. And if you're just tuning in right now, um, make sure to catch us on the web at www.potluck-online.org. And to catch more information about Jazz Booth, go to finalsaluteinc.org and also Miss Veteran America. So we will catch you next time. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.